All right, I'm supposedly live. Here we go. Well, the first thing I will do before saying, well, welcome everyone, actually, I should always say that first, is, um, uh, yeah, I've just been sneezing again. I don't know, oh God, I hope, I, I've always been kind of suspicious that I am actually a bit allergic to uh, uh, Leo, so that sucks. Charles Latour is still here, I think. Uh, good morning, William Aarons. No, I just went to check out uh, CNN and then WW2 channel, both are quite depressing. Okay, good. Uh, anyways, it is great to see you. Um, yeah, we'll see how this works. Um, I mean, I, you know, obviously want to cater to you guys as well. And that was, um, you know, I, I, I think um, I'm also yet again still in flux to see if, um, you know, if doing live streams. Uh, good morning, Meandering Mike. Great to see you. And it is on the top of my list after welcome, everyone, is to uh, congratulate you on uh going past 500 subscribers as well as um well for us uh for me um yesterday evening's um um world premiere uh, uh thing that bob there for your five game giveaway i thought that was really neat and it was awesome to see uh mrs meandering there live well live as well well she was live it was your other thing i wasn't so that was totally neat and also to have i which i thought was really nice to see was that um there was an actual person there viewing that one that was that I thought was, you know, for me, like, um, yeah, the, the, what do you call it? The, the, the icing on the cake or whatever. Yeah. Sorry guys. I'll try not to whatever. <laughs> so Mr. Yeah. So we'll start off with that. Um, the one thing I do uh, really want to know, uh, well, I, I did got, I did get to see a little bit of, um, the Western, uh, Western front ACE, um, Unbought well, a double dose actually from Charles Satora. That looks like a dandy game. Uh, so I'm hoping to see, like, I've thoroughly been enjoying. Um, and it was weird because I'm not really, um, I think Mandarin Mike mentioned, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he has or not, but uh, um, not really into air combat, like, not you know, his first love is air combat games kind of thing. And it, I've never been the same as me. It's not, I mean, it's kind of like just you know, whatever. And the same as naval stuff, but I've thoroughly been enjoying watching um, the Aces of Valor Dad versus Son playthrough, uh, and he seems to be re getting right into it as well. So um, yeah, I just I, like I'm understanding the flow now. It's like okay, now I can see why it goes okay, and then the planes fly away and they come back for another. They're still around, kind of thing. It's it's neat to kind of structure that dog uh, dog fight into my head. So I'd love to, um, I hope to goodness that uh, Charles Latora, well, it seems like you've been enjoying it so far. Uh, you said you did, you, you did your first one there. So I'm hoping that uh, that continues. So I, I'd like to see that. Manry Mike, um, I know that you're um, finishing up the introductory scenario game for Tannenberg. I, and it's awesome to listen to some of the comments that you're making through the playthrough about um getting a bit like, no, nah, that's not the way I kind of like to do. I understand where he's coming from or whatever with the, uh, the combat stuff. And I was like, Oh boy, I can't wait until, um, you've digested all, you know, after the playthrough and everything and do your analysis, what you've done before your post game analysis and, and saying, Oh, you know, look up these books and so on and so forth. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to that, uh, for sure. Um, also, William Aarons, I, I would love to know what the heck you've been playing or what you get up to that way or even reading that type of stuff. I mean, because uh, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, this is the whole point for me, it, like in some ways to interact is because you guys lead me off onto another garden path, uh, which is freaking awesome. I mean, that's what I want to, you know, it just you find out more and more and more and more. All right. So let's go to because I think there's a fair amount of stuff to get to. Um, I also am hoping that um, I'm using again the slide presentation thing to help um, keep me on track and also, you know, visually as well to give you guys something to look at besides just staring at me for crying out loud. Um, I think I've done the History Heroes trivia um, uh, points wise. I think I don't know if you guys uh, saw it in the description bit, uh, which was. Um, uh meandering mike said 105 points and that was even from last week uh, he was saying that in the comments or whatever uh, on one of his videos um 
that uh, he was too zonked out and he couldn't, like, he knew the answer but couldn't actually get to it. So that helped other people. Uh, 89 points, William Aarons, 83 points, Charles Satora, and then everybody's, you know, uh, down, but that's such as life. Also, if you guys let me know if, uh, because I'm, I'm assuming that, oh, most of you guys or all of you guys have played uh, Axis and Allies, the World War II version. I'm just curious to know um, what you guys thought about that. Uh, I know that, I think you, Charles Satori, you met, uh, if I remember reading in a previous comment on one of the live streams, you were saying, ah, it's not really my type of game, uh, it, too long or something like that. Um, that was the other thing. Uh, I haven't looked at them yet. Uh, someone um, suggested it on one of the, um, in the comments for my Axis and Allies World War I 1914 uh, videos. Uh, that there was some um, convention rules. I've downloaded them. I haven't, and I briefly looked at them. I suggested using them with uh, Rob, but Rob was um, uh, focused on, on, we just never got to it that way. So that was, uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, I do have it in these sources and links. I hope I left it in there. I don't even know if I put it, if I've uh, amended the, um, the YouTube description for this, uh, for today's live stream. I'll take a look later because if I haven't, I certainly better make sure I pop it in, which is I found uh, in the con sim, uh, the old con sim forum. Uh, darn it. I can't remember what I was looking up. Prob something probably to do with the Ottomans or something to do with amphibious assaults or how to help the Russians or something like that, obviously. Um, anyways, and it was too alter alternate or one was an alternate uh ro russian mobilization thing and it looked extensive like someone did a really good job on both of them uh well from what i fr from what i call in my mind um the heavy hitters um <clears throat> excuse me for der Velkring, sorry <clears throat> so um it's in the links anyways or, or if it isn't i will <clears throat> sorry i will put it in there um all right, let's maybe go to my, oh, yeah, let's do the History Heroes trivia thing first. I think that's a good idea. Let me get to the banners, and then I'll release the, the hounds on the first one. Oh, which, when I saw this first clue, I don't know if you guys are going to go, well, I did, It's which is ironic, because I actually did what, <laughs> what the clue did. You'll see what I mean. I was stunned that it was that old that someone used this. I was like, say what? Oh, yeah, hold on. I want to make sure I've got the history. Okay, I do. I want to make sure I put this in in the comments for uh, as well. I just want to make sure I've got that in here. All right. And I'll pop, pop it in the comments first. There we go. So it's uh, the first recorded use of OMG in a letter to me from, uh, from Lord Admiral Fisher in 1917. I just, I'm sorry, but that just knocked me sideways uh there you go the first the first recorded use of oh my god or omg is in the letter to me from lord admiral fisher in 1917 i don't know about you guys but i was like i just i guess i i just never expected that to be such an old <clears throat> an old saying or whatever i was just like wow impressive um that's it. I'll leave it on that for now. And I'm going to go to the spread uh, to my little slideshow and then and go from there. So, yeah, like I said, if you guys uh, have any um, any comments or any um, things you guys want to talk about, about the Axis and Allies World War II uh, thing, or if you are uh, from what you've seen little wise from what you've, you know, um, of the event from anywhere of the World War One, And if you've seen any like compare like, go yeah that kind of looks they're using the same mechanic or no it, it looks rather different it would be interesting to see i think rob has played the other one i'm not positive so that would be uh neat to find out okay let's go to the spread uh to the um thingamabob so i can put it on here present actually i can pop you guys giant size for now all right and i'm going to put in another um another um clue in a second here as soon as i get the well, yeah, I can just add to the stream. Boink, straight up, right on. I'm going to make him bigger. There we go. Perfect. I'm going to get rid of the banner for a sec while I talk about it. Um, hide. So, yeah, that's going on today, as as you know. Uh, um, I'm going to go to the comments, sorry, so I don't miss it. Um, 
Yeah, Rob Thompson, uh, they're having the memorial conference. Well, it's obviously going on right now. Um, and like I said, I thought it was it would have been a nice idea because I did want to talk about the um, one of his lectures there on um, um, the development of the British rail uh, railway system in World War One. And um, as I was starting to take notes, I was like, oh, gosh, I wouldn't you know, like I said, I, I wanted to share it with you guys. And then I found out that he had passed away earlier uh, this year. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's when I found out about the memorial conference happening today. And that's why I was like, well, maybe it would be a kind of a nice thing to buy, a t uh, you know, uh, purchase a ticket, a seat, um, you know, on behalf of all of us, really. And uh, that's why I started ch chatting with them and suggested possibly I would love to uh, live stream uh, one of his lectures. And if it was possible, if I could purchase it, uh, purchase licensing rights. And I didn't hear from them for a few days. And I thought, OK, they may be thinking I'm a bit of a nut. But it was actually um, just due to the fact that the person I was communicating with was not working for the, uh, those three days that uh, she only works uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or whatever. Anyway, she got back to me, but I think uh, she got the wrong end of the stick uh, when she because uh, she was like, oh, no, I would just love to let you know that um, it is being recorded at the Tally Hill conference because I had mentioned to her that I'd watched I uh, was watching, a, a, I think, the same lecture again. And I, or no, another one actually. And, um, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. It was the one there on the, um, um, on the, um, the German offensives in, in 1915 that didn't happen, but were planned. And I got to see what the tally ho, uh, room looks like or whatever. And I was, and I mentioned to her, and that's when she said, Oh, uh, just to let you know it, uh, all the lectures will be, um, like the event will be recorded and it'll be put on YouTube later. So I was like, okay, that's what she, I think that's why she got the wrong end of the stick here. If you see here, like, uh, with, the, uh, like the Peter Hart, beast of burden, the British soldier, 1918, Roy Larkin to destroy a road, get a three ton truck. Uh, Dr. Chris Phillips logistics overshadowed the Calais conference in 1917. Uh, Alex Churchill and Andy Locke for mobilization, empire building railways in the great war. And I think, yeah, so I didn't want to become like, sound like a vulture or something to try to get, um, you know, access to one of his lectures for today. I was like, no, let's don't push it. Just leave it alone. So I was like, no, no, no. I just, like I said, I left it alone. We're not going to do it. But um, it's nice to know that these are going to be up ahead, um, you know, on YouTube. And uh, one of the reasons why I like Rob Thompson, well, first of all, I enjoy his style. And the guy's a logistics nut and uh, talks about trains. So why in the world wouldn't I want to, you know, um, you know, watch his lectures? There is, a, I'm not sure if he has, a. am pretty sure uh, the Western Front Association, if you go to their channel, they, I think they have a Rob Thompson playlist. I think he has six lectures or something that went through them. So if you're interested in uh, going in, I... Uh, like I said, the development of the British railway system in World War One. I'll put it in the link again. Uh, I've got it on the previous ones. Fantastic, really, really good. And I'm gonna uh, re watch it, watch it, and stop it again because uh, I want to take better notes. Basically, he, re 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 you know, he repeats it often. It's um, um, what did he say from port to railhead or something like this? Uh, just amazing. Uh, he goes through the whole way. It's just fantastic. I was like, wow, it, really good stuff. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And like I said, hopefully this will help me uh, zip along here. I'm sorry if I'm banging on about this freaking show, but it is fantastic. Uh, I'm angry that uh, it got canceled after only one um, season. It's only six episodes. Um I, I think I did mention that, um, oh, it's, you know, not very gritty and blah, blah, blah. It's what I would say. It's not very gritty. I would say it's not. Now I'm now cluing in. It's not over the top gory and whatnot. And that's great. But it's hitting on some big topics. Uh, it's got the Pals Battalion. It, I think it was in one of the episodes uh, that was uh, brought into it. I just find it really, really good. And it, oh, I actually ended up going off to BBC to find out. So, because sometimes they do this with cancelled shows, they'll um, uh, put them on to audio dramas uh, through, um, darn it, big, oh, darn it. I can't remember the name of it. Big, big something or other. Um, but, anyways, um, 
or that sometimes they'll novelize, they'll continue on with uh, some uh, novel, big finish. That's it. Novelizations, uh, but doesn't seem to be. And uh, from what I've been reading about the Crimson Field, um, I can't remember her name, the creator. She wanted to have, I think, about five or six seasons. So it's it's unfortunate, but the production must have cost a freaking fortune for this thing. It is impressive. Um, really good. And my God, there's more backstories than you can shake a stick at. It is ridiculous. I am so into this. It's like, oh, darn it. I've got only an episode and a half left, but I better hurry up because I'm about to lose my 30 day um, thingamajig. And you see her on the very left there. She's from Dr. Fisher and all that. And there's a, there's a lot of it. I think he's from the bodyguard. And so anyways, blah, blah, blah. It, amazing. I highly, I highly recommend it. Um, Yes. Oh, my God. Believe it or not. Hopefully you guys can see this full screen or whatever. Believe it or not. Yeah. An, an Atlas map that I keep saying every week I'm going to show one and I don't. Uh, the reason why, but the, I jumped way ahead. I was supposed to show the Italian one uh, a month ago, probably or whatever. But I brought this one up because it uh, it's connecting in with, uh, well, uh, lots of things, really. I constantly keep hearing about this back and forth uh, between you know, when I've been reading up or listening to the lectures and so on and so forth of, you know, France saying or, you know, the Western Front uh, having issues and saying, you know, so, well, look at what Russia did. They supposedly mobilized a little earlier than they should have or rushed it or whatever to the fronts or whatever uh, to help out because, you know, the French said, hey, can you help us out at the very beginning of the war? And the Tsar was like, OK, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to honor my, uh, you know, my, uh, my word and so on and so forth. And then you look at this here, this map, and this is the Russian appeal. And it's, you know, tying in also with my game. And from what I've, like I said, yet again, I've been reading about, you know, so on and so forth of like um, lots of spring offensives that occur in, in the Western Front because, you know, Russia was having a hard time. So they're trying to ease off the pressure. So that way the Germans don't send so many free uh, reinforcements to the Eastern Front on and on and on and it's just amazing what i did find i uh, find interesting is that these ones over here I, hope, I don't know if you guys can see my arrow i hope so i don't think you can if not i'll uh show you what i thought was interesting <clears throat> are the uh, possible diversionary attacks on turkey and austria that was that that one blew me away it was the austrian one <clears throat> excuse me yeah, not so much the Turkey one, <clears throat> or, well, this one, yeah, okay, uh, along here did, <clears throat> uh, Palestine and whatnot, but here, this one I thought was a no-go zone, um, well, it is in, in Der Weltkrieg, um, Der Weltkrieg, uh, the rule system uh, would not, uh, maybe the Grand Campaign would, I'm not sure, but uh, in whatever's, you're not allowed to, um, you know, well, I guess you would, because I mean, what would be the point in having the Grand Campaign thing? Um, okay, thanks, Manny. Mike, you, I, you can't see my cursor, which is maybe potentially good. I don't know, but I'm yeah, I'm pointing up towards the Adriatic Sea and Albania and whatnot. That was one of those things I wanted to try in my way, way back when was uh, when I was asking some of you guys, for example, even Manny, Mike, as uh, you were going to be, um, well, you are uh, the virtual Albania and, and Charles the Tortoise. Uh, Latora, I keep calling him Charles Tortoise because right now I'm uh, knee deep in um, um, the German movement on my on my map right now with all the Festung divisions. And William Aarons has Greece, and uh, I was going to ask um, Charles Latora if I could, uh, you know, send some troops over, uh, use him like kind of thing. Like, don't get upset when I start trying to use uh, bring British troops to like try to help some kind of supply line to Serbians, not actual combat units, but just get some people up there. And now to see this in real, like this actually, not that specifically is what I'm saying, but just to say that these type of things, you know, are, we're on the, on the drawing board. I'm just like, wow, this is impressive. So that I finally, I'm just, I'm well impressive in the fact that I finally got to put an Atlas map up. Cheapers jump it. All right. So this I'm, um, why I've got this one up and it's no, it is, um, uh, it is the truth. And we'll go to, uh, I'll share the screen. Uh, I'll get rid of this for a second because we don't need to, I'm going to stop this one. Um, how do I do this? Oh yeah. No, I'm just going to stop the, stop it, remove it. Okay. It stays there. Good. So now I can show the 
um, go. So like I said, every week I wanted to um, randomly roll a, like a World War One game on BGG so that way I could find out some stuff because it's like I don't know most of them and, um, you know, and also help uh, share with you guys and you guys would know. And it was just random again. It's not because everybody and their dog is playing um, – uh, air combat world war one games right now it did end up being uh, wings of glory but it was one of the accessory <clears throat> whatever so i just went straight to the world war one uh thingamajig so hold on i'm just going to make sure that i can <clears throat> uh share the screen here i'm gonna pop on this guy here there we go go back to this present yeah, so like I said, in the long run, I don't know, guys, if we'll see. And you guys got to let me know, too. I mean, I don't know if this is uh, maybe there's a better format for me to um, share information about the stuff that I found, in, uh, you know, each week rather than a live stream. Maybe it should be uh, some other thing. Maybe I should just uh, do a blog or like a big, long, whatever, community tab thingamajigs or whatever, because um, that's the main thing I want to really get into. OK, so we'll do that. And you guys can see that. All right. So, yeah, it's the Wings of Glory uh, World War I uh, thing. If, as anybody, I know it's massively popular. Um, and I'm, I, I don't think I'll ever actually play the game. And is this considered, uh, do you guys know, like, what is this considered? Is this a miniatures game or it doesn't really matter to you guys? Or, like, it, to me, it doesn't really matter. But I know the way people just love to um, stick things in boxes or whatever. Um, let's go to the images. Oh my gosh. Sorry. I forgot to, uh, continue on with the, um, hold on. Let me, let me go to the, um, I forgot to give, um, uh, give you a, another clue. Darn it. No, oh, wrong one. I'm going to drink some more water. All right, so you guys didn't get it first off. Okay, goody. So because they don't have them in the uh, these clues in this in this sequence, and I'm trying very hard to um, give them in order of what I in my mind would be like order of uh, uh, difficult or you know getting easier as we can say I guess here. So there's the second one. I'll pop it in here. So I was the son of an MP and grandson to the then Duke of Mar Marlborough. And remember, you get one point just for um, uh, just for guessing. So please let me know if, you, if any of you guys have uh, played um, this game at all. Um, but boy, oh boy, it looks pretty darn nice. I know that Little Wars TV played it, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't uh, the World War... Oh my God, a blimp. Uh, it wasn't... Oh, two of them. It wasn't the World War I uh, version. Jesus, look at them. Uh, the, oh, my God, those are official ones. Okay. I, was, I wasn't sure if, because I know lots of companies will say, hey, this is, you know, compatible with whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know what I get. Yeah, certainly it's not a, I don't know what kind of people that it would call it a uh, game. But, um, yeah, I think this was actually played at the 8th Annual uh, Ottawa Military um, Hobby School show that I went to with Rob <clears throat> and it was uh, being played by the Ottawa miniatures gamers. So look at that. Wow. That looks amazing. But uh, to be honest with you, I don't think I'll play the game, but I would certainly like to, and I'm pretty sure fandom two has them, uh, the local hobby store near my place. Well, uh, near my work at, Oh my God, look at the trench lines. That's so cool. Oh, uh, not the creators. eh? geez, but they so do that. Well, but I was thinking about actually just buying these, uh, buying the odd model. And um, I found that they have the Albatross D2. And for some bizarre reason, I've become enamored with the um, Albatross D2. So I'm going to turn this off for a second. I'll get rid of this one. There we go. We're back to me. Um, Boing! Meandering Mike wins. Uh, gets it. Wow, that was well done. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, yeah. Oh, well, you did it. Well, uh, Winston Churchill. So let's go straight to, I'm going to get rid of the banners. That was fast. Holy smokes. Um, uh, let's go to the, uh, the picture. So that way I can, um, watch just though it's right here. So that's good. Hold on. I'll, uh, make sure I can, um, 
share the picture and we can go over the all the all the clues and then go back to the slideshow and, and go from there. And please let me know if you guys like the uh, the way this is flowing or, you know, or what have you. I mean, really. No, obviously, like that's the other thing about I find this, you know, very odd sometimes is it's such a one way thing. So I'm trying to figure out ways of making this more, um, you know, back and forth engagement. But then on the flip side, I've also, as you guys have noticed, uh, have difficulty uh, keeping um, on track and also dealing with comments. So it's like, well, what do you want? So here we go. Um, share the screen. Or window. Boink. Winston Churchill, well done. So I'll, uh, I'm going to shrink her down here a bit. There we go. I think you can see that. So I was the uh, first Lord of the Ad Admiralty in charge of the Navy at the start of World War One, And as you can see here, like the numbers are, are not the way I went because I was like, okay, you're going to get things pretty quick. Um, well, you did anyways. I was the son of an MP and grandson to the then Duke of Marlborough. Um, I supported the Dardanelles campaign, Gallipoli, in 1915 to attack Germany's ally, Turkey. Uh, Gallipoli was a disaster, and I was blamed for its 205,000 British Commonwealth casualties. In 1915, I rejoined the British Army and commanded a battalion at the Western Front. I think that was my third uh, one. I was like, okay, you people won't get it yet. Uh, in 1917, Lloyd George brought me back into government as Minister of Munitions, and I think that was one I certainly didn't think you guys would still get. And this one, which I said, like I said, I actually probably did say, oh my God, uh, the first recorded use of OMG is in a letter to me from Lord Admiral Fisher in 1917. Cool. Well done. Uh, uh, Mini Warmut, good morning. Um, uh, and Mini Warmut says, good morning. I'm having my morning brew, listening and building minis. Good stuff. Keep at it. Thank you so much. Um, so that's it. Let's go back to the slideshow uh, thingamajig. And like I said, hopefully this will help me um, stay on track. I also did, um, I didn't do a, a major thing, but actually, you know, before we go to the slideshow, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to forget about this, just going to go very quickly um, over uh, some of the stuff that I found in the chronology. I'm still, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out a proper, uh, a whole flow to this whole bloody thing um, and whatever. And like I said, I also want to, um, uh, be of some value or whatever, you know, I don't want to be like, what, you know, I don't want to, anyways, let's just get on with it. Uh, that's not anything amazing that I found out. Like I said, there's tons of stuff that happened. I'm just saying, um, I didn't find anything amazing that happened in the Western front, except remember, I'm not sure if I mentioned it last week, which freaked me right out was the fact that, uh, the Germans recaptured, I think it was the Germans. Uh, and, and Charles Latour says, morning, Minnie. Um, I think it was um, the Germans. I'm not positive about this, but they re um, recaptured a cemetery in in uh, in, a uh, in a town in the Western Front. And I was just like, God almighty, that is just grim. Like, Jesus H. Christ. Uh, in, the East, uh, in the Eastern Front right now, um, it is a bloodbath and a half, and it's that uh, thing that has gone into full effect. Uh, so it's not just the Gorlitza Tarnuf breakthrough there that uh, basically essentially is being led by Mackinson, who, remember, uh, learned many of these lessons that he's doing, this concentration of artillery fire, massive concentration of artillery fire, but brief periods um, from the Battle of Neuve Chapelle, yes, Battle of Neuve Chapelle, way back when by the British, um, and um, using that uh, pretty much to full effect. And I mean, they've now, well, they took Lemberg, what, uh, three weeks ago or whatever, uh, found out from listening to the Great War um, podcast uh, channel, uh, YouTube thing, you know, concurrent for this week, that um, six. 360,000 prisoner, uh, Russian prison, prisoners had been taken in the past month. Uh, and I was trying to convert that into Develt Creek terms for demoralization points. There's a other, another thing. I'm not really sure. I think I've uh, brought this up before and I'm using it over and over and over again in my game. Um, you know, saying that, okay, a division, we're just going to use a, a, a number here of 18,000. Then a Russian division is four strength points. The problem is then like going into you know it's not 
that's not really a true representation of, of people because, you know, if you convert that, let's say for Dervelkrieg with the eight strength points on average, let's say for a German um, uh, infantry division, well, if you use my arithmetic, that what is that saying? That the Germans have twice the amount of people than a Russian and it's, no, it means they're more combat effective pound per pound, I guess, in a way. And that's all being, you know, uh, incorporated into that number. So I, I, damn it, I really, I really enjoyed um, using that arithmetic of converting down. I think it was what forty five hundred um, um, people per strength point. Because then I was like, oh wow, look at I could uh, go, you know, trying to figure out all these casualties. But now I'm starting to go. Well, that's probably not a good number to use. So maybe I'm going to have to figure out some kind of average or something like that. But darn it, I, I thought I had something there. Because uh, when I was looking at that, I was like, oh, gosh, maybe I can uh, I'll talk to you guys about it later of the, um, you know, OK, 360,000 prisoners. Let's see if we can convert that into demoralization points, because remember, it's double when you get uh, when you surrender in Dervel Creek. And I was like, oh, I can't do that anymore. It's not really a, a proper number. So, OK, that's that. Uh, is there was anything else. I Well, that's just for the Eastern Front. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like I said, it's this massive push. Darn it. I keep forgetting who the heck it is in the middle that's pushing towards Warsaw and um, and way up north there with Ludendorff uh, towards Riga uh, in, in that area. Um, yeah. So that's it. I think for the Asiatic, let's let me take a quick look here. This I thought was uh, interesting. Uh, I don't know where the heck it is, uh, but I was like, what the heck's going on here? Uh, on the 18th of July, it said that uh, the Turks reported to have ordered Greeks to evacuate um, Avali, which is north of Smyrna. And I was like, whoa, what the hell's going on? I, like I said, I don't know. It would just be interesting to find out how. why are the Turks telling the Greeks what to do? Uh, I have no idea. Um, that's it. I think, yeah, let's go back to the slideshow. And um, the, the nice thing is, oh my gosh, there's only four more episodes left of uh, the Callendale thing. Um, this one's only 15 minutes. So let's go back to the slideshow and please let me know if you guys, you know, uh, this ain't going well, it's going well or what have you. Okay, so I think I have to go to share the screen. Nope, hold on. It's back to the, aha, I've already added the um, thing. So I can go to the full on here. Okay, so you've seen that one, and that brought me to, like I said, to the Wings of Glory, talking about this thing. And I don't know about you guys, but I was so would love to just buy these just to have them, um, you know, in my house. That would be freaking awesome. And that is the Albatross D2, and for some bizarre reason, I have uh, seem to have become enamored with it. And I'm like, yeah, the D3, and there's the D5 or something, and all these other things. Um, your browser has blocked your screen. What the hell? Are you guys seeing this? I hope. I hope. Smyrna was on the Turkish Aegean coast. Thanks, uh, William Aarons. I'm going to go take a look at it. Please let me know. It says your browser has blocked your screen. What the hell? So um, I'm going to have to reload it or something? Or hold on. No, I'm fine. I think. Let me know if you guys can see these, uh, if you can, can see the slide screen. Uh, can you see the slide? Good. Um, this one I was listening to last night. And yet again, this is also, um, oh my God. And I'm going to have to say it right off the bat because it's, um, it's a little fact that I'll probably uh, forget mentioning to you. And I found out last night listening to this. Holy smokes. I was like, like say what? Supposedly. Um, a uh, Vickers machine gun could be used um, um, effective uh, for effective indirect fire of up to 4.5 kilometers. What the hell? That is, I'm like, Jesus, Murphy, that's impressive. Uh, anyways, um, uh, this is uh, through Nebula, and it's real-time history. Like I said, I only paid $30 Canadian. I'm not sure it, uh, if I'm going to get it forever and ever and ever. I hope to goodness I do. Because uh, these 
these podcasts are fantastic. It was this guy talks about the psychological analysis of warfare, um, uh, talking about uh, how to like use mixed troops and also mixed, um, you, like don't just use the same type of artillery fire, uh, mix it up a little bit. Um, that um, uh, an intent, a short intense burst seems to be better than a long drawn out one. Uh, so on and so forth. Anyways, uh, I, it also tied in yet again with the Battle of Neuve Chapelle and lessons learned. And, you know, uh, the British went in a different direction, which you can see like with the Battle of the Somme and so on and so forth. I just found it. Uh, but I will say this on the, on, the, on a flip note. We'll go to the other one here. Um, I will say this on a flip note. I don't know too much, uh, but I'm probably from that camp A, just from... Uh, a lot of people the way it is is thinking that like uh, a lot like the british officers and so on and so forth like the higher ups the generals and whatever were, were butchers and so on and so forth were you know idiots and on and on and um i'm starting there seems to be a lot of pushback in um uh in um the like you know in um in books and articles that are being um, published right now. So I was like, okay, maybe I should start. It's the same, I guess, in the same type of feeling when a lot of people, same way with me, uh, you know, when someone says World War I, I automatically think trench Western Front. I don't think of anything else. Um, oh, and on a side note, Charles Latora, I know it's Western Front Ace that you've got, but I was so wishing to God that they would have had the Ottoman Air Force um, included just a little tiny bit would have been kind of nice, but it, it didn't look like there was any planes available um, for the Ottoman Air Force. That would have been nice. Uh, same as I brought this up because, um, like I said, I wanted to start, um, I'm getting into this point of trying to figure out um, how to move. So it's, it's strategic movement, how to move um, things from one um, regional map, I guess, on into Rural Creek to another Um and I guess, for, so that TC over here, you see the TC5, TC, of course, you can't see my cursor that Manny Mike mentioned on the very right-hand side. Charles Latour says, does include Italians. Oh, yes. Okay. So at least it's got that. Uh, so that would be interesting to have some nice little um, uh, Austrian-Italian. Um, um, if, it if it's got Austrians, that would be awesome. Well, I would hope so, for crying out loud, if it's got Italians. Um Anyways, yeah, so I'm trying to slowly figure out, from what I know, one hex on here is equal to a mega hex on the scenario maps, uh, those things that have the little red star in the middle, and then you see like a big black outline, and that um, they were mentioning that one hex on a single track rail line, uh, like you can see one from Elizabethapol to Rostov, that is the equivalent of... 10, oh, sorry, eight movement points or something like that. And the double track is 10 or, or 10. No, sorry, the other way around. But hey, what, obviously the double track is less, uh, you know, you can get around much quicker. But I was just, I'm starting to clue into taking a look and it's going to take a long time um, to move Russian troops from the cock, cock uh, I can't say it, uh, from that front. Um, uh, over towards the eastern front now which is why i started wanting to look at naval uh, whatever long way to go long way to go but boy oh boy what of uh, charles latour says as soon as my british gets flamed i'll try an italian pilot cool and i will be honest with you charles latour i was absolutely stunned <laughs> when i was listening to your uh your video there uh i think i'm not i think it was the first one mm, me yes and you're like yeah i'm not good you were just like just saying, oh, I'm going to be this. And I was like, what? I'd never heard Italian pop out of your mouth once. I was like, wow, interesting. But now it, now it's uh, not going to, it's going to go the other way. So anyway, oh, speaking of which. So, um, and I'll show you the website so you guys can take a look. Because I wanted you guys to see the website. That's not like this magazine. So this is one of the magazines I picked up for a song at the, uh, the, mili at the, eighth annual, uh, the Ottawa 8th Annual Military Hobby Show. Hold on, I'm going to see if I can get the um, I can get rid of Winston Churchill now. Uh, get to here. I want to bring on the. Um, hold on, guys. I just need to find out where it is. Uh, Mini Warmot. Uh, just for you, boss Charles Torres. Thanks, man. 
And uh, you know what's so weird, uh, Charles Latora? And Minnie Warmut says, uh, good morning, Charles. Sorry, stepped away a bit. Uh, you know what's weird, Charles Latora, is that um, uh, Hissy Cat uses, the, uses boss, that term, so much. So even when you said that, I could hear, hear his voice in my head. I was like, whoa, this is freaky. Um, so I wanted to show you if I can find it, darn it. Um, ah, here it is. So it's in the, um, uh, and if it isn't, like I said, I will put it in. Uh, I got to put you guys back to pseudo size and then get back to here. And then I'm going to stick. There. So I'm going to show you this bit. Hold on. There a second. Present. Uh, share the screen. This guy. So I don't know if you guys know of this thing, um, but uh, so this is uh, the website that, well, from that magazine. And then I went to here because I was like, oh, gosh, I want to get some more. I would, well, I would love to see if I can find the specs and all that because the magazine is impressive, impressive. And you see people that are actually doing um, uh, mini warm up. Uh, hey, Nangue, I finally bought some Decision Games Hex Encounter. Wow, impressive. Uh, which one did you snag? It would be interesting to know. Um, what, uh, Mini Warmut, uh, what I've, um, I'll let you know that the very first game that I purchased was from Decision Games when I got, uh, I guess, back into Hex Encounter. It was the uh, Patton's First Victory. Um, just the little 40 counter games. Okay. Um, mini war mentioned. So I guess the mini or the folio would be, I guess the, the really, really, really tiny ones. I hope it works well. All I can say is this, if you do, um, run into issues, there's a, a ton of, a ton of resources out there. So don't get, uh, like, ah, oh, this sucks or whatever. Um, yeah. And it was obviously you didn't spend a bazillion dollars, which is wonderful. That's exact same reason why I ended up getting the, um, uh, Patton's first victory uh, one. It was, I think I paid $30 Canadian or something. I was like, okay, sounds good to me. And it wasn't a huge game. And, uh, and I watched Marco Omni gamer um, do a review of it and a, a tiny bit of a playthrough. And I was like, okay, this looks nice. Anyways, guys, if you guys also wanted to see um, it also has skyways. Um, oops. Uh, I just missed uh, Charles Satora. Thing here, hold on. Um, yes, um, uh, mini war mutt. We know we can hear your minis crying in anguish. <laughs> oh, Lord of mercy, mini war mutt. First, Saratoga morning, uh, Marino del Rey. <clears throat> I think I wanted to get that one often. Is the Marino del Rey one, Wilson's Creek, uh, Germantown, and Little Round Top. Cool. <clears throat> um, and where are we? So, yeah, I know that <clears throat> there's other people that are not into, you know, World War One, but they also have all the World War. You can. Well, no, sorry, they didn't. It's 1920 to 1940, but pretty close. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of those planes were still um, zipping around. So. There you go. <clears throat> there you go. So I, I, I'm going to get rid of that. You guys are back to here. You guys just see me. Um, now we'll go back to the. Um, I'll put it back to the stream. There we go. And that'll help me out. And this one as well, it'll also show you. Um, so this is the what I'm getting access to now uh, that I'm a member of the Western Front Association. So I wanted to show you guys too. Uh, but I'm not going to, like, obviously I can't, whatever. But what I will do is go back to the live stream, whatever, and see if I can find where the hell it is. Really need to, oh, there it is. And we'll go, just take a quick look. So and hopefully it'll blow your mind. Well, it's blowing my mind. I can tell you that much. Hold on here. Um, all right. So I know I can show you this because I'm in it. Uh, Charles Latora, all in good fun because he was uh, poking, poking many more warm out a little bit. Um, okay, so we're going to present here. Share my screen. Just in front. Boink. All right. So there, you guys can see that. Awesome. 
Uh, May Warmut says, I do dig how these Ziploc games are so easy to store. Just throw them in a file cabinet. I know, man. So there you go. I, I, you can see all the stuff that's available to members. I'm just... Uh, and you know what suckered me in? It's kind of like a, a drug pusher with a little giving you the hero, the first heroin baggie free was the trench mapper. Uh, they let you, they let you fiddle for a little tiny bit. And then they're like, Oh, sorry. If you want to continue, you have to be a member. I was like, Oh, okay. I guess I'll be a member. That was pretty quick. Um, so it's, it's, I look at this guys, look at this Remember, I've got, uh, I've got a, pair of stereoscopic the, uh, glasses. I mean, come on. Come on, guys. Print that off. on, And I've done it. I mean, it works wonderfully. So, um, oh, I don't know if you can say, see that. It keeps bopping up. So there, you can see that. I mean, my God. Pretty neat, eh? And that's all I do. I just uh, download them and uh, you know, click for a larger view, kaboink, and away I go. Um, pop this back. I hope you guys can see. So I'll get rid of this. We're back to just me, I think. Um, Charles the Torah Hex gave me much grief when I started down the mini rabbit hole. Ah, that's true. That's true. Um, and I'll go back to the oh, yeah, I just got to keep hitting add to stream. Jeepers jumping. So, anyways, uh, hopefully, you guys, and like I said, if it's uh, I will update or amend the um the uh, YouTube uh, uh, live stream description, if I don't have them in here, uh, popped in. So that way you guys can pop on here. I think I paid, uh, it's like four, I think I paid 40 pounds or something per year or something. Oh, and this we're going to find uh, Charles Latora, but fun grief. You damn right it is. So I'm, I'm popping this on and it's also a link to, um, of, we'll have it in the description for that YouTube guy. He's doing model train, uh, it's for model trains, but it's like a podcast thing as well. And he has a friend of his who uh, just asks a bazillion questions. And similarly to what Meandering Mike mentions there about, you know, um, I've learned so much or the best from, um, you know, uh, playing games and so on and so forth, um, uh, you know, uh, about history that way. And, you know, um, I am learning so much about trains from this guy. It's not, I haven't even finished watching his uh, steam engine, uh, steam engine locomotive uh, 101. And I just pop in this picture on here uh, very quickly. Um, and I'm just going to show you how fast, I don't know what the heck you guys know about trains. And I knew barely F all before uh, listening. And I haven't even finished listening to uh, the podcast. And like I said, it's just so well done. The guy is excellent. And I've got him in the uh, description. I think I've mentioned it a few times in the podcast. I'm going to just very quickly I'll show you how much what I know. And it, and I may get a few things wrong, but I don't think so too much. I can tell you that the back end here, the back end, I know, I'm sorry, you can't see my mouse. Um, the back end there is a, is a tender, and that's where the water and the coal was stored. Uh, and if you don't see one, that it's normally connected to the train or if they have a side thing, uh, like they would call them saddle tanks. That would be a tank engine usually, and I would uh, probably tell you that the uh, that thing was a short, not necessarily a, a short um, haul thing, like maybe a switcher or it worked around the tr uh, uh, rail yard. Um, this one probably probably didn't uh, do the fact that it's got a, it's got a tender. Um, it's a two eight zero, uh, and it. That means it's got two front wheels. It's got eight drivers. Those are the ones that actually uh, do the propulsion. Um, and it's got zero. It's got nothing in the back. Uh, that also tells me that um, it's got a hell of a lot of torque and um, a lot of power this way. But it's probably not generally a, a passenger train or a very high speed passenger train. I think the if it if it would be it would have a lot of maybe like a a, a two eight two or a four eight four so I I don't know like I said I'm just learning here man but uh, the uh, from what I know is the front and the back wheels for were more for stability and especially when you started getting into high speeds so this was pro uh, this was also a consolidation locomotive and this would uh, the engine and I also. 
from what I limitedly know. Um, and like I said, this, if you guys are interested in trains, this is, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, good morning. Um, I can barely, I just probably could not pronounce your thing. Great to see you. Do you like the Alaskan railroad? Um, I know of it just from train sets, but I don't know anything else. Uh, um, and if you know anything about it, please let us know. Um, I know that this is a North American built train due to the fact that it's got a headlamp on uh, on the front that is mounted, supposedly British made ones and uh, maybe German ones didn't. Um, this is the boiler. It, it was not a, just a big giant tube. It had a bunch of little flues where the water and the, uh, the air went through and the, the fire, I guess the, you know, the hot air and everything. Um, I can't remember what the heck this th front bit is called. Um, that's it, really. I, I was just like, and I'm just astounded because I was like, I'm never going to get any of this stuff. And um, um, that's that guy is just knocking my socks off. Uh, and I just can't wait and to coincide this with learning about. Um, so, oh, yeah, this is a consolidated train. It was used quite a bit. Um, it was even produced in Canada. But a lot of it, a lot of the stuff. Um, so. From what I've been reading with the Canadian, uh, when they uh, helped out with the British over there and everything was they used a lot of the American uh, technology and used their know-how and brought it over. And on a side note, I can't wait to get into it when we're, we, we start getting into there is that as the Americans were prepping up uh, to get, you know, and like to get uh, to zip off in 1917 and all that, um, the Canadians were heavily involved um, talking with uh, uh, with training and going, hey, this is what we, you know, experienced and uh, this is what we've been, you know, uh, finding out about. So it wasn't like uh, a lot of the troops and so on and so forth were completely green. Americans were not going over completely uh, green in the head of, OK, you know, they were hearing stuff and also not not just at the low end. It was also, you know, at the higher ups. I thought that was pretty cool. So that's going to be interesting to, uh, to get into. This is a black hole I will not jump in, jump into. I refuse to bring a train set or anything into my house. I will, or powered, I will, any, I just don't want to have anything that connect, bring, no. Uh, give me something that looks like that. I would love to have that, like maybe a diorama, but I don't want anything. No, no, please, God, for the love of God, don't do that to me. All right, uh, we still have a ton of time, guys. So I'm going to pop on the Calendale. Um, pop me back here. I don't see why not. Oh, 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 there is a couple of websites I did want to show you very quickly. Um, it's, um, or just this one here. Um, and it should, uh, bring us into a, a little chit chatty bits of s some stuff. Uh, hold on here. Uh, present, share the screen. It's this bit here. I don't know if you guys know anything about this stuff. Oh, shoot. Um, can you see it? No, there we go. Okay. Is, um, uh, it was about, uh, the British and, uh, the Russians with their submarine fleet up in the Baltic, which also brought me into this, uh, I, I'll bring it, I'll pop it in the, it's in the links and description things about finding out that the, um, uh, the Russians also had planned an amphibious attack on uh, Istanbul uh, um, way before uh, World War I uh, kicked in. So I thought that was rather interesting to find out. Also that there was, a, there was an amphibious assault by the British down near Aden. Uh, one of their ships that was coming up through there, they, it stopped off. To, but yet again, I need to learn up more about it. It's uh, the, the attack of something or a uh, shake. She or something. I like I said, I'm just still learning up on it. But uh, all this. Um, oh, this is the other thing, uh, which I thought was uh, interesting about this at the very uh, bottom here was th this guy here ends up inadvertently. Uh, Francis Crum, uh, Cromie or Cromy ends up becoming in charge of the freaking uh, Russian uh, fleet up in the Baltic uh, uh, when everything goes to hell. Uh, um, you know, when uh, the Russian government collapses and all that stuff, and then ends up finding out that part of the uh, the deal with the Germans is that they have to hand over their submarine fleet uh, to the Baltic, and that includes the freaking British subs or whatever. And they say, screw this, and they scuttle them, scuttle them all. I thought that was 
freaking amazing. So I'm just going to share this tab instead. I'll take a look at your at the comments just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, yes, Charles Latouris says, "Choo choo, you damn flip and straight." Um, and there we go. I'm going to have to uh, mute me, guys, and please let me know if um, everything works good. All right. Uh, oh, you're in. All right. I'm going to mute. As we roll into July of 1917, the Germans launch an attack here, taking this hex. They don't have the ability to advance very well into it. The problem here is things are getting weak. The French are going to come back. The Germans are going to come back. It's just going to be this sweeping back and forth for control of hexes. Now, the French have more forces, so they can do perhaps a one-stack attack and then maybe sweep further, maybe keep extending this line creating a pocket here by driving up towards Sauerbrock. I don't know. Um, we'll see how the numbers work out and, and whether it's worth it. But the German position is still not good. They can sweep forward and attack, cause additional losses, but I don't think they're going to be able to do anything to keep this sector alive. They've been trying to shift troops over. They can rip some off of here. There's no question. They've got too many there, but it's a slow process to move things across. Uh, of course, if you do it one hex at a time and just shuffle the whole front, you get a counter that way. Oh, boy, is that a pain in the ass. Uh, but the other problem is the Germans are withdrawing units constantly. To I think these are building up their, their assault units. I haven't looked yet because... The rule indicated to me what I thought was, hey, these units kind of come off and get replaced by assault units in situ. I don't think that's the case. That's the impression I had. I don't think that's the case of how the rules actually are stated. And I don't see any indication of it in this chart. What I think is happening is you're withdrawing specific units and they come back later as an assault unit, in which case I don't care what the numbers are on them. It just matters what the strength is, right? well but it does suck to have these units being pulled off the line because this part is getting weakened to the point the french could launch an attack uh it's scary it's really scary this is the weakest part of both sides lines actually down here but the french have put a massive force their lines aren't any stronger. Their lines are actually vulnerable. The Germans could conceivably get a breakthrough, maybe up here or something. But what would it do? What would it do? <sighs> Germans get kind of lucky. No new fires to put out. And they may actually want to make attacks on this hex now. This has been stripped in order to make offensives here. Pushing back, driving the French back. Would definitely strengthen their position, shorten their line. And uh, overall, it looks kind of like a positive thing to do. And now the French are uh, launching attacks without supplies. Uh, basically, no infantry supply. They supplied the uh, tank and they supplied some artillery, grabbed this hex. That's the cost for the Germans taking the hex they did. They couldn't defend what they had as well as they could, as they would have otherwise. And they lost a trench hex because of it. That's kind of painful. But, you know, we're going to play this fast and loose this way and kind of see how things swing back and forth. It still ends up very much, you know, not these broad sweeping moves. It's not like mistakes cause that kind of breakthrough. It's still chunking away at the enemy. And it looks like we've entered into another peaceful period of retrenchment or whatever. Uh, the French have abandoned their offensives being out of supply. The British have not started one. They could use more supplies. There's no reason to start one off when they don't have very much there. Their army is mostly built up, but there's still a few pieces in there that I think I can dredge out additions for. There's, at the very least, this guy up here. That's seven more strength points. Um, so yeah, they can take some more reinforcements uh, in terms of replacement points in play. Uh, the French have to rebuild their army. Uh, they did a lot of damage to it in these assaults. 
Largely, it's they have enough replacements on the board to do so. Hmm. This probably ought to find its way somewhere. Uh, but eh, it's going to take time and probably a couple of months to rebuild their supplies to a point where they want to attack again. I think they've given up on the ability to punch through here easily. They could have continued their actions, but they keep getting driven back. It's nothing too great that they're obtaining here. We'll see. One maybe high point, we're beginning to see U.S. engineers showing on the board. Uh, there aren't going to be a lot of U.S. troops showing up this year. It's really held off for 1918, and there are restrictions on how you can use them as well. The engineers obviously can build track, but it's kind of an, an encouragement to the Allies to see more forces showing up. And we're through three years of the war now as we hit well, into August of 1917. Minus a few days, maybe. Um, nothing much happened. We've got some of the trench lines were finished at this point. And then some new ones showing up where things were a little chaotic at the beginning of this month. Um, more supplies coming in? I don't know. The French are set up so that they kind of like to do a push. But they want to do that towards the end of the month. <coughs> so that they have a chance to follow it up with next month's supplies, if need be. If things look too solid at the end of the month, they may just allow the trench lines to form. They've got tank, although not many. They're not getting replacement tanks. They don't, repla tanks don't come in replacements the way the infantry do. You don't just continuously start getting them so that you can plan. What it ends up being is, well, they're specified in here, they end up on there. You may have a vague feeling of them, but eh, it's not something you can really say, oh, yeah, I'm going to get one tank a, a month next turn. Uh, nothing along those lines. Le Grand Gauche shows you uh, that kind of production capability where you know, yeah, I can expend my tanks because I'll have this many, or I'll be able to do an offensive from this month because of this. Here you'd have to look through the charts and try to figure it out from that. And those are a real headache to try to discern just what's coming in when, when you start uh, perusing them. And really, it's better off from my point of view to just say, well, hell, I don't know when they're going to show up, <laughs> which isn't really the way to run a war, but um, it's about the only way to for me to survive this game. Still not much happening. August went through uh, without any additional attacks, mainly because the English couldn't find purchase anywhere that they want to hit. They have to make an attack very shortly, probably the first turn of this month, just in order to kill off some men so that they can start cycling their uh, replacement points. They don't want to just waste them. Um, one of the weird factors here, of course. Uh, the, the lines here became solid and entrenched at this point. Um, the French don't particularly want to launch an attack. They've got the uh, shaken morale. So they're getting very, very low, only 30 um, uh, supply points each turn, which makes it difficult for them to build up an attack capability. The Germans still have a very high capability to draw new, new units in or, or new uh, supply points in, it, but they have this huge level. They can reach up to 400 at this point, which means they don't have to attack quickly, and they can delay as they wait for their assault troops to come in. So nobody wants to attack at this point, but the Brits are going to be forced to early in this month. It's not going to be pretty at all for them, uh, but it's really just going to be an attritional attack, get rid of some of their own manpower, do some damage to the Germans, their demoralization levels are good. Losing the manpower is okay from their point of view. It's what their goal is here. So it should work out okay. As expected, the English launched their massive attack. Some French support, some French artillery again being included in. Just to reduce the cost in supplies. That cost in supplies was probably approximately half of what Britain had on the table, a little less than that. 
but they took a hex. The tanks, the, the strong firepower, et cetera, it didn't matter that there were 24 strength points there for the Germans. Uh, 24? Couldn't have been. It had to be less than that. Um, oh, no, 24 indeed. Yeah, uh, 15 losses is after the two-thirds situation. So... Without the tanks, I don't think it would have been a break, but it was not a tremendously high die roll. Um, it was a three, I think. So a higher die roll might have broken the line even without the armor. But, you know, when you get 190 strength points hitting one hex, and some of that is the tank, that's an extra eight strength points in there, they can, because it doesn't count towards stacking, sort of. You can have um, one tank brigade or three battalions in one hex. I don't know what tank uh, battalions are. I haven't seen any yet. Uh, but anyway, they punched in pretty easily. And now I think the Germans have to pull back again. They have to get out of this hex. They don't want to fight this war. They don't want to. They don't want to fight against the Brits here. Uh, the terrain's just not that valuable. They haven't decided where they want to launch their attacks. There's only one thing in France that they can really gain, other than casualties, that they desire. That's Paris. That's all that's left for them. The rest of France, well, you know, there's some small cities. Uh, Belfort, I think, is sitting on one. But there just aren't a lot of valuable territories to take from the French at this point. But Paris is the only thing that terrain-wise matters to them. The problem here is, well, if you take, you know, even if you take Paris, you don't collapse France. It doesn't look like it's a guarantee, but it'll push them further along that route. But the Germans have tightened up their line, and now they're beginning to get the assault troops in, and they've got to decide where they want to launch their attack. They want to go back for the same terrain that they just gave up. I mean, that's what they historically did, basically. Uh, do they want to go up here where the terrain's a little cleaner and there might be less damaged territory? Uh, that damaged territory is harder to, to advance through. I, I don't know. I really don't know. But that's not this day's decision. This day's decision will be to run away from the British a little bit, to pull out... And, and give up some ground. The question, of course, is do they want to give up this far? If they get pushed out of here, then this becomes the only real corner that they're presenting. And the English used the double hit tactic, hitting with a mobile attack first and then using two hexes to hit the hex. They didn't use the uh, tanks in this, although those help a little bit. They don't help retreat you, the enemy, necessarily. They ended up wiping out the German units that were in this hex. The first attack was not pleasant. It was like 27 losses for the Brits to 13 for the Germans. And you start to say, wow, why would you do that? Yeah, but that softened it enough that they could do 21 to 7 as the, the follow-up and get the hex. Overall, they're paying a slightly higher cost to get the hex, but they're collapsing the German line slowly and steadily. This game does allow you to do that as long as you have the supplies at this point. The, the Brits have so much power that they can just bludgeon their way through everything. And the Brits continue their kind of cautious pushing forward, just grinding into that German line. Another hex gained. This time they were surrounded by three. They've got another, you know, hex up here they could go after uh, or down here. They've got this uh, certain amount of flexibility where the Germans have to defend those couple of hexes pretty strong. They had defended the hex that got taken pretty strongly. The Brits basically threw everything in. There were, they ran out of supplies on this. Their artillery, they uh, drained them in and of itself. And they were able to partially supply the armor to get into this hex. That means that their strength point totals are just going to start decreasing on these attacks. So if the Germans can defend these corner spots fairly well, uh, they become less attractive because the Brits can just wait. Those are entrenched already. It's these non-corner spots that are the risk. For this month and next month, while they're digging into those hexes, they're vulnerable. 
And those become the places where the Germans really have to defend, especially this one, which can be hit by two hexes. <coughs> um, it is quite possible that the Brits could keep pushing and get behind this Hindenburg line stuff that they constructed, making it useless, <laughs> basically. Okay, and well, you know, the Brits decided to halt their attack for the reasons I, I was specifying. They need some time to shuffle things around, etc. So we stretched out through the rest of September. We're in October now. Let's take a look at the front from this side. I kind of like looking at it from all angles, but from here you really kind of see how much it's evened out. So much more than the sharp jag here, of course, from the German side. Looks a little different. It always looks different when you walk around the board. I do like this view a lot, but I can't play it this way. I kind of need it facing me directly, so I end up speaking about it all the time, facing in a situation which doesn't really show the direction quite as much. Wow, look at that. Ah. Anyway, up this one goes. Unmute, and there we go. I want to uh, constantly keep this within one hour. So, um, yeah, I've got more stuff to talk about. Tough um, for myself. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, I'll let you guys um, – hope you guys have a great uh, rest of your weekend, great week ahead, and um, that's it. Thanks a lot for showing up. Hope you guys had a good time, and um, like I said, I'll pop in the um, – I'll make sure that I've amended the um, – the live stream description so that way uh, all the sources and links are popped in here so you can uh, go and take a look at all the stuff okay see you later thanks a lot bye